Um, uh, yeah, today, the, the idea for today is uh, we were, uh, I will just do a sh really short introduction that probably we will repeat that later, but just for everyone to think is that last year Europython decided to, to move the conference to be online and that was the first time ever for this conference and Europython is, uh, is a completely different <laughs> event, like uh, usually it's like a 1200 uh, even uh, part attendees in a venue. So there was a lot of things to learn. There was a lot of work. Uh, there was a huge, uh, a really big group of uh, volunteers uh, helping there. And we are thinking that it's a really good idea to share the knowledge. So we are really doing that. So there's some documents that are public uh, in our website. Uh, we can share the link later probably. Um, but then the idea, we were thinking that this to test yeah. this format. So today is kind of a test, right? So the idea is uh, to meet all together and if people want to know about organizing an online event, what are the challenge, what are the things, what are the perks, you know, uh, we are here to answer. That's, that's the idea for today. So and, and let's, let's go around uh, of presenting everyone. So I, I, can, I can say I want to nominate Raquel and then Raquel, when you finish, you nominate the next one, the next one, and, and then we do that. We have to okay. drink a bottle of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> it's your option. It's okay. <laughs> I do have the Europeason Edinburgh bottle here, but it's just water, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm drinking mate. So. There's no, no true Scotsman. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm Raquel. I'm uh, also one of the organizers uh, for Europeason. And I had the privilege of working with a pretty big team this year after we switched. Europython online. So that was really lovely. And that's why we want to build on the momentum and then perhaps reach out more to the community and see how we can share more of our knowledge with others. So here we are doing this. And now I will nominate um, Stephen. Stephen? Stephen? Yeah, Stephen, sure. Yeah. Stephen. Thanks for coming. Sure. Hi, I'm Stephen. I don't know if I'm an imposter, but I um, haven't organized, but um, not with Python, but I organized previously with uh, for 16 years with various high treble and ACM groups. I'm from Dublin. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. So ironically, I was really, really looking forward to presenting my first talk this year in Dublin. Uh, you know, <laughs> so that sucks. Um, is next year going to be online? Probably, guys, do you think? You think it'll be in person? Let's, let's, I want to write that answer down and we will yes, reply that's a big after question. the yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, I'm going to yeah. guess, I'm guess, I'm going to guess that it's 60% likely to be online again. No? No? Okay, no comment. Um, cool. Anyway. <laughs> um, I, 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 want just, I just want to finish the, to everyone to say hello. So we give a few more minutes to, for other people to join and then okay. we can talk about that. Gotcha. Okay, sorry, Nicholas. Yeah, just, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I want to, you know, there's, everything has gone virtual. So Pi Gotham, for example, the New York Python user group, they're doing their virtual thing. Um, I think it's October or November. And you guys all know about pajamas. So there's there's like a full rotating calendar now of everything worldwide. And actually, sorry, what was the, the name of the dude from Amsterdam? Sorry, I forgot your name. The guy from Amsterdam. Nicholas. Nicholas. No, 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 the, from Amsterdam. Rotterdam, uh, maybe? Sure, I was going to say that, the, the Dutch, like, there's like a sort of a weekly and monthly calendar of online Python groups now. It would be really cool to sort of get them all in one place. So in, Sa in the San Francisco Bay Area, we also have SF Python, uh, and there are some others. I, I, think that, I, th I think the Python org uh, event has like a whole listing of things. Obviously, if you never submit any of your listing, then it might not be included. But I think there, that would be the best place to submit the, the listing. Well, the Moen, the Moen Wiki? Yeah, I've actually gone through the Moen Wiki. It's it's a little bit, needs some sort of decrafting. Like some of that stuff is stale. Some of the stuff still exists. Some of, yeah. some of the stuff is groups of 10 people. Some of it is groups with 20,000 people. So, you know, some of them, they only have three three meetings a year on an occasional basis. So. Anyway, yeah, I mean, just, just a observation. But it's nice to meet you all. I mean, I know all your names from the, the mailing list. Especially Vicky. I never met Vicky in person, and I was hoping to meet all the Pike and Ireland crew this year, but 
and raise a point. I say. You can still probably do it online. So you need to nominate the next person to present, to be present. Uh, well, since I mentioned Vicky, might as well pick Vicky. Um, hello. Uh, this is just an introduction, is it? All right. Uh, so as Stephen said that, um, yeah, I used to run PyCon Ireland and uh, for f the first four editions uh, before um, I burnt out because I was also running all the Python Ireland stuff um, being involved with that from mid-2005 till I stepped down in 2016. Uh, currently, um, I'm kind of um, uh, doing, uh, kind of promoting more diversity in tech, so um, I'm running kind of smaller uh, meetups now um, in the form of PyLadies Dublin and, uh, and other stuff. I run a ton of other stuff, but Python related, that will be uh, the main one. Uh, but I do um, try to make sure that Python Ireland, PyData, all the stuff that Chuck and Leicester, that I try to promote all that, especially like whatever local events are happening around Ireland. So, um, so next person I am going to point to is uh, Martin. Hi there, my name is Martin. I'm also on the board of Europe of Europython Society. In my normal life, I'm professor of geoinformatics and computer graphics. And I do have some practice now with several online conferences. So uh, yeah, we just had one this week again, a little bit similar. It's actually an optimized version of the EuroPython event. So I think we are ready for, for, um, for more online events maybe, who knows? And you can ask about that. Okay, I nominate. Um, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm based in New Zealand, so it's uh, 5.30 in the morning at the moment. Um, I'm the General Secretary of the Odoo Community Association, um, and we've got our OCA days coming up shortly, which is normally a code sprint of a couple of days and then talks and presentations running alongside. Um, so I'm just here to gain, gain any tips and tricks to just try and help things run smoothly. Um, any knowledge that you have to impart, I am willing to hear. <laughs> Abbas, uh, is your, we don't know if your audio is working or if you are there. I'm going to ask Abbas to unmute to see if that works. Okay, Francesco, you're up. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> Well, my name is Francesco. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm living in, uh, uh, in Granada, Spain. Uh, I work in astronomy and uh, I love Python and uh, I've been uh, uh, also helping uh, over the years, um, volunteering better um, with the EuroPython conference when it was in person. Uh, I'm organizing an online conference, uh, which is about software development in astronomy. So a little bit more general than Python is going to be online uh, in um, the first half of November. If you're interested, um, you know, what's a better, <laughs> better occasion to learn something about software and astronomy. And uh, um, I've been uh, helping organize the next edition of EuroPython. So next up, uh, I guess, is Mark. Hi there. Sorry I was late. Um, I had to pick up my daughter. Um, I'm, I'm Mark. I'm a um, member of the EuroPython Society um, board member. And uh, I've been running EuroPython for quite a few years now. And we, we thought that this format, this Ask Me Anything format might be something useful to, you know, help other conferences, other conference organizers to maybe learn a bit about uh, the experience that we've made, how, how we ran the event, what we found, um, what worked, what did not work so well. And, and so perhaps uh, this is interesting for some of you. Um, I've, I don't know who else uh, needs to introduce themselves, so... Uh, so I think the one that... So yeah. I was asking Avas to write something in the chat. So sorry, I saw the chat right now, so I, I missed that before. Uh, okay, so he's saying, my name is Avas, I'm a beginner of Python. Uh, he's learning NumPy, Pandas, and Deep Learning. 
So Abbas, if you can write later, what are you looking for for, for, for this uh, Ask Me Anything, or if you are participating in an event, that's good to know. Otherwise, I think Leo is there. Leo, is your audio working? Okay, mm -hmm. I know I know this Leo, okay. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, hello, so we are, we were saying that uh, we were doing a small introduction, so you can say who are you. Um, Okay, uh, I will practice my English right now. <laughs> it's a little bit rusty, but uh, I'll give it a try. My name is Leandro, and I'm from Python, Argentina. I'm the treasurer of the NGO of Python, Argentina. I'm one of the collaborators in the organization of the PyCon here in Argentina since uh, 2016, I believe. Now I'm working at Mercado Libre, uh, building the Python ecosystem inside this uh, this company. Cool, welcome. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too, Gilga. Okay, so we don't we don't have a fixed format for today. So Rebecca, you were saying that you are uh, you are going to host an event. Francesco also, uh, Stephen, I'm not sure if you are planning to do that, but I think we can we can go to uh, some fixed format or we can share some data. I think it's important for us, if you go to the, Raquel share a link in the, in the I, I can probably maybe share my screen, I don't know. And, but if you go to the chat, Raquel just share a link and we there is a public documents that we are sharing with all the, all the documentation that we did for the okay cool so all the documentation that we did for the euro python so if i think that's that's a really good resource for anyone mm -hmm. and and there are a lot of documents they are quite long so i would say let's just try to uh, to have some questions so anyone has a question um, I do. Am I on it? Yeah. Um, I did you do pre-recorded sessions or was it all live? How did you how did you do it? <laughs> uh, I don't know how how we decide who's going to reply. Maybe we can. Because uh... <laughs> we we had it planned on doing everything live, and then this week there's just been uh -huh. a discussion. Oh, maybe we sh some people aren't comfortable presenting live, so maybe. Um, it would be better to pre-record some of the sessions and then have mm -hmm. the talk, the speaker there at the end for questions and answers. Um, so, so I was uh, wondering how what success people may have had yeah. either way. Yeah, and so, uh, so, oh, if I can interject also, so in uh, for Pi Bay in the Bay Area, we use Remo.co as a platform. What platform did you guys use? So uh, EuroPython was a uh, live. So we were, we did a backup for a few talks. So we asked the speakers to record a video if they wanted to, but I think we got only a few. Mm -hmm. uh, the conference was live and there was a Q&A optional. So we were asking the speaker if they wanted to, to have questions. And then we were uh, asking those questions live. For what we did is we were using Zoom yeah. For the Zoom webinar. So this is, is different than this meeting, right? So in Zoom webinar, yeah. you only see the, the speakers and then the attendees are not, uh, in, they don't have camera or audio. You can enable the audio like an uh, option. And we were using Discord as a chat, right? So right. all, the, all yeah. the chat, all the, all the conversation was happening on Discord. Mm -hmm. And then the conference, the talks were live. I really, pers and then for, we have, four tracks, maybe four or five, I'm kind of sure. So for each track, we have a person as a ho hosting the track, mm -hmm. right? So I, for example, I did that. Uh, and, and then for each speaker, I will be presenting the speaker. I will be asking some questions. So we will break the eyes. And then uh, the host was the responsible for the questions. So we were using two different ways. Zoom has a option for Q&A. So in, in right. a webinar and, and, and then 
the host was selecting questions from from that one asking the question live for yeah. us that was that was important because then it's in the video right so yes because otherwise the questions are, are and you can also decide it because for some talks you will have a lot and then we were also asking for people if they wanted to ask live because there is an option in the webinar that you can enable the audio mm -hmm. uh, just for someone to ask a question and then you can disable it Mm -hmm. uh, that was not really popular, but I think we did a few. I will recommend you to see the videos in our of our conference. Yeah. There are like 60 or 90 already public. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe there you can see the format. And then other thing that's important is, so you're seeing the, here the, the speaker guide that we did. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important part for us was, and, and the hosting guide. So the hosting is for the person that's hosting oh, and then right. for the speaker. And then we did a training. So we did, we started, I don't remember how many weeks in advance. Three weeks and two days, oh. I think. So this sheet that, that uh, Mark is showing is the training sessions that we did. So for each one, we were we have all our speakers. This 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 sheet uh, template we are planning, I don't know if it's public or we are planning to publish it. But basically we were asking all the speakers to join and we were doing a re rehearsal basically like uh, mm -hmm. presenting the person and that was i think that was really really important for us it took uh, time but then we are really it's a way for us to learn issues to help the speakers to to have a better setup to test the audio and and mm -hmm. i personally believe that there was a lot of things that were uh, were going really good in the conference because we did the training mm -hmm. so I, I think live my personal opinion is live is really nice I don't like a conference that is recorded. That I go in there and just to watch videos. I, and I believe that the, I got personally some feeling similar to a real life conference. I think mm -hmm. that was my personal feeling. But, yeah, but, but if you check the resources, because I, I know it's, they are quite long. So if you see, I don't know the number of pages, but they are long. But mm -hmm. at the same time, there is 24 pages, right? That one. But there is a lot of detail there are a lot of small things that we were like learning um but yeah so i i will let mark or raquel uh, to, to maybe add some things more and maybe we can we can give you a a bit of an overview of uh, what we have available that you can actually already read online yeah so the, the hosting guide and the speaker guide we don't have online yet we need to clean those up a bit and then we're going to put them on the page as well mm -hmm. uh, we, we set up this page here which is uh, at uh, europython this is the the website europythonsociety.org and then you have this uh, your short menu up here and then you have conference resources over here uh, we can also paste the link maybe into the chat uh, where's my chat window I think I just did, yeah. Oh, you already did, because yeah. that's interesting. I don't see my chat right now. Anyway, um, so this is the, the, the page uh, where we uh, started to put things online. Um, mm -hmm. the, the first link that you see here, this is a collection of uh, you know, on, online conference tools. This is how we did the research in April and May. Mm -hmm where we then try to figure out which conference tools to use. And then after we then decided which tools to use, then we built the, the concept here. And this is documented in this document. So if you go here to the conference tools uh, document, then you see that we have uh, 82 pages here. So it's quite a bit of information. Uh, we first put all the different solutions here. Uh, evaluated them. Then we ended up uh, using Zoom and Discord. And then we added uh, additional information specifically for uh, Zoom and Discord further down here, which is in case you want to use these tools over here. Uh, in case you want to use these tools, I, I guess these things are uh, relevant and, and uh, mm. probably a good resource. Going with. Yeah. yeah, probably a good resource to use because a lot of this information is not readily available in the documentation that you find online. Mm -hmm. So this, most of this basically um, we found by trial and error and, you know, learning along the way. So we put everything in here. So that's useful for Zoom and Discord. For other tools, of course, you will then need to do your own research. Um, since we 
decided to use these tools other tools have uh, you know appeared on the market so maybe you want to use some other kind of service um, at the time we did not have that many tools readily available the the, the most um, let's say the something that we found would would have been nice uh, is is something to to have a, a central platform for doing everything in one place mm -hmm. so the the issue that we had was that we actually had two systems here so we had zoom and we had discord and the audience as well as the speakers and the the uh, moderators always had to monitor two windows which wasn't necessarily ideal nowadays there are platforms that integrate both uh, so if you can find one of those, then that's probably going to give you a better experience. Right. On the other hand, having two different systems to, to work with um, actually also opens up some, you know, fallback solutions. Let's say something works in one system, but not in the other, then you can just, you know, use the other system um, to basically work around the issues that you find. Right, so that's uh, how we decided to use online tools and then we developed the, the concept here. So we decided on the session formats that we wanted to use, the schedule, um, how we wanted to run everything, the chat system, how we wanted to set that up. Uh, we initially, well not initially, actually we put this into place. We wanted to have one channel per track. Uh, we wanted to also have one channel per track um, actually, we did not do it this way, so we need to update this. What we had is we had one channel per session that we uh, organized. So for every single talk, we had a separate channel. That is something that we would not recommend doing anymore. So that's one of the failures, right? So um, I can show you the Discord server. Let me just open it. Um, where is it here? Sorry, did, did you not have a theme track like say infrastructure or web or machine learning? You didn't do that? We had uh, four different, um, uh, well, we called them tracks, but they are, were actually uh, not, you know, specifically uh, grouped by, by topic, let's say. We only had, we had a data science track, uh, which was uh, the track four that we had at the conference. So we, that's the, the only grouping that we kind of uh, tried. Uh, for the other tracks, we basically just put them into different rooms, the, the different talks, and then we arrange things to uh, to work out. So, uh, what you see here, I hope you can see this. This should be a dark window that you're seeing there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is Discord. Uh, it's it's an application that's well originally was was used a lot by by gamers uh, where they you know play games together and want to communicate with each other. Nowadays, it's opening more up to all kinds of different things. So you can actually use this for a lot of chat activities and also has uh, audio video built in to some extent, not to the extent that we needed for the conference. But if you have, let's say, you know, 20 people coming together wanting to do audio video, that works fine. Um, above that, you know, Zoom is the better platform, definitely. So uh, what you see here is the different categories uh, and I close all the all the categories here that have all these rooms. Uh, but then, if you if you open these, then you find lots and lots of these um, channels here. And the the problem was that we had uh, over 130 sessions, so we had over 130 of these channels, mm -hmm. which then basically led to people, you know kind of diving into these rabbit holes and not getting out of them again. So it, it kind of broke the interactivity that we wanted to achieve on the hallway track uh, and, and on the main conference track uh, channels, which we had here. We, so we, we, we were trying to, to have not a lot of channels and at the end we failed, right? And, and, and the conclusion is that it's not a good idea. I think uh, Martin, you were in a in a conference uh, a few days ago, and I think uh, you went for the a few a channel per track, right? Yes, I only had one channel per track. Um, this actually worked pretty well. So uh, yeah, uh, I can check out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine nine channels in total. The lobby had three, and the virtual conference. Um, had six, but I only had two tracks. I have to say at uh, at the other conference, so we limited this to a to a bare minimum. Mm -hmm. So that worked quite well. 
And also we had some live talks. Most of course were live and we had two pre-recorded talks because the speakers had some technical difficulties maintaining uh, the connection. Um, but I have to say live talks are really much better. Um, mm -hmm. It's just live and, and it's different. I mean, if, if you watch it pre-recorded, you can, you can just watch YouTube movies, basically. That's, that's not, some, not a conference in this sense. And I attended a couple of weeks ago, I attended the conference, they all pre-recorded. And as an attendee, I have to say, it's really, it's really very boring. If everything is pre-recorded, um, some, something is missing. It's not like a real event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really agree with that and I think we did consider, especially like some of the speakers also mentioned that they might prefer pre-recorded because they get pretty nervous as we really do understand, but I, I think the energy is quite different even even though I do agree that the pre-recorded ones can be smoother, I think you in this kind of online conference, I think you want that sort of energy that anything can happen. And yeah. I think that's quite important. I just want to bring up one little detail. If you are to host your event also on Zoom and you mm. want to have the pre-recorded ones, then you really do want to test that in advance because um, I think Zoom is quite optimized for this kind of live sessions. So if you are to have the the, the, if you were to have the share it to the pre-recorded ones, then you will have to do the share screen. And what we found out is that it's not always working very well. And that's why Mark um, actually set up these VMs for us to, to be able to play ads because we have these sponsor ads and we want them to be high quality. And we found out that wasn't very easy to do. So we had to like do these often on the VMs just to make sure the quality is good. Otherwise you often end up with 360p, which is not ideal, especially if you have a, like a demo, live demo or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I okay. think that's a really good point. I don't know if it's in our document that we were, we configure in our infrastructure, we have like a five VMs and one, for each track, there was a virtual machine hosting the Zoom. So if there was any issue with our internet or anything, the webinar was still working. Uh, and there's we one thing, I'm oh, sorry. Go, go, that's it. No, uh, uh, there's this one thing about like pre-recorded talk, because I've, I've got some um, have commented, people say that if it's pre-recorded, -pre they can add it like uh, subtitles for maybe non-English uh, speakers or maybe for you know, like non-native English speakers or maybe for people who have uh, hearing impaired. Um, I think that's a good point, but I think we could maybe have live caption or something like that uh, that would work the same as well. So, yeah. There, there is, a, there is a, a, a free online captioning service and um, some Vancouver nonprofit told me the other day, I forget the name, it's like Tiger or mm -hmm. something. Do you, if, let me try to find the link, I'll drop it in the... Um, also, if I could mention the, the, the thing I just posted in chat. So with regard to live versus recorded and how to keep the energy. The killer feature that we learned from PyBay is the ability to have a voted question list. There's a separate Q&A tab. So remo.co is better than Discord in the sense you have a separate Q&A tab. People post the questions. They have an incentive to post the question early. People vote on it and there's a moderator and the moderator can decide generally we keep questions to the end to keep the cohesion of the talk because it's mm -hmm. been videoed. But if the, if the speaker cadence is off or they really need some energy or they need somebody to refocus them, then the moderator can make the decision which questions to ask when, what sequence, how to bundle them. So the moderator has really has the power in the live uh, live session to mm -hmm. keep things on track and keep the energy alive. It's way better than recorded. We did exactly that with the questions, right? So people was asking the question in Zoom, you can vote them and then the moderator okay. was deciding when to ask and which ones. Okay, I see. Yeah. And, also, and we had have, a canned applause. We had a canned applause track at the end, which sounds corny, but it actually works. So that that's funny because I think the more complex thing that we did was that all, all the hosts we were having some custom configuration in our setup to play sounds. So we were playing some applause every, every time there was a finishing a talk. We were playing some sounds and uh, cheering, and we were using the this applause the sounds. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to mention that you know th this may sound a bit this may sound silly, but um, when you're at an online conference, especially as a speaker, 
and you don't get this kind of feedback from the audience, it's actually very frustrating because you've been just, you know, talking for half an hour, maybe you get a few questions, but there's no feeling for the, for the speaker to, to get this audience feedback. And, and because, you know, just having a few thumbs up in the chat, it's, it's nothing like that. So the, you know, playing the audio is actually quite nice and people loved it. So. Don't, you don't have to do what I did is I uh, one talk, I forgot to turn it off. <laughs> and I was playing that for probably <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> one thing that um, we are a little bit struggling with, uh, with uh, uh, this, this other conference I'm organizing is that we have lots of posters and that's very traditional. We have 120, 150 posters, uh, some editions up to 200 posters. And uh, uh, we are offering people the possibility to uh, have a pre-recorded lightning talk uh, to go with their posters. And we show the posters as a PDF, that's the idea. And then uh, in the, all the um, you know, breaks and whatnot, we just, uh, the idea is to show the, the, the lightning talks like on a loop and uh, I, I don't know how do you folks feel about it um, do you think is a is a good idea what I'm hearing here is that live is better than pre-recorded and I agree for talks absolutely that's what we are planning but uh, for this lightning talks this, this like um, for posters I don't know um, we are a little bit conflicted. I have, I will say lightning talks are, are the best thing ever, even online. So if you are planning to do a lightning talk recorder, you are like killing lightning talks, right? Because all the nice things about the lightning talks is that it's short, uh, you need to finish in five minutes. Uh, it's, I, I think there's a lot of reasons that lightning talks is I don't see a format of five minutes or, or, or pre-recorded, but then for the poster, we hosted, I think, four or, or five, Le uh, less than 10. We, we did have a few more, but the, yeah. the posters, uh, to, be, to be honest, uh, the, the sessions were not really well organized by us, so we kind of left the speakers to their own devices. And we also did not really prepare that uh, too much. The original plan was that, we have the uh, the speaker uh, share the screen and then move around in in the PDF and zoom into various parts of the PDF because normally you have these uh, these A0 kind of PDFs. Zoom around in that PDF and then explain to the the uh, people, the audience directly in a Zoom meeting like what we have now, which is a bit more personal than a webinar. Uh, the various details on on that PDF. But uh, in the end, I think it did not really work that well because, uh, you know, it, there's no way for, the, for the, um, the people interested in the poster to point to certain things or to make it clear what they're actually after. So um, a, a lot of what you have at the conference when you do a poster is missing in the online format. Now, back to the, the, the question that uh, Francesco had there with the lightning talks, I, actually, I think, um, what Nicholas meant was this kind of format where you do impromptu five-minute sessions, right? That's basically what Lightning Talk normally is. But um, I, I think you're coming more from the uh, the time limit uh, from a from a scientific scientific conference because what I know from scientific conferences is that typically when you have a poster, you actually just have five minutes to give your talk, and that's actually a talk. It's not a Lightning Talk. Uh, and then you, you guide people to your poster and tell them, okay, if you have questions, please come to my poster. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So it's a different I, format. Yeah. I, I can suggest for posters. So I gave a poster um, live, uh, five minutes. Um, I lost my timer because they told me the timer window will show. The timer window shows for the moderator, but not for the speaker. So I had to mentally time myself. Then my neighbor's car alarm went off. Then some other people started chattering. So. So, uh, but it, it, it worked okay. Um, but yeah, the best practice we found is simply ask lightning speakers to demo to each other, like at lunchtime or whatever. And like any rehearsal is better than none. And with regard to the highlighting, I mean, you can always do slides. You can always have a, you know, I mean, you could throw fruit at me, but you can say PowerPoint, um, the Mac one, 
you can use any of the standard presentation packages, especially syntax highlighting. And that works okay, especially if it's going to be video. It's less nasty than a, a little cursor. So, so we I might have to sh share like, which presentation packages are found to work well online. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. I remember I was in a training session and so, so, someone, one, uh, someone was uh, in the training and the person told me, yeah, but I'm going to present a poster and I had no idea what to do. So I started asking our chat. <laughs> uh, so it's true what Mark was saying that we were not really prepared and we, were, we just had a room for them. The idea was this poster is going to be in this room for one hour or 40 minutes and you can go there and ask. I, I can, my feeling is it would be nice to have a five minutes presentation for them and then uh, a way to contact uh, the person. Please don't create a channel. But, uh, <laughs> but but I think it's a good idea to cover like because I, at the end it's that's the format right so you can listen to to the person presenting and then you you can go and ask more questions so maybe you need to be really clear how to find that person in the in the chat uh, after maybe I don't know pointing the username in, in the website in the schedule or in a page or something what what so, do you folks uh, think about Zoom fatigue uh, <laughs> did you when you organized uh, you know, I, I was absolutely not, uh, you know, uh, available for this year Euro Python. Uh, I was, you know, this year was a bad year for me, uh, coming to a close. But uh, um, so I, I actually wonder, you know, um, what what's your experience with this? You know, having a, you know a session very packed and the lots of lots of content. Euro Python has a huge amount of content, always does. But online in particular, what uh, what would you feel about you know this Zoom fatigue? Like after three hours in a Zoom meeting, you're like dead or something like that. I think Mark, you can show the uh, the schedule. Is, <laughs> yeah. is it in a perspective of the of the host, or is it of a perspective of audiences? Yeah. <laughs> Both. <laughs> I, I so can answer. I can I can show you the where is it. So we do have bricks, right? The bricks in between can help a lot, I think, in my yes. in my experience. Have very little know, breaks, like it. very short yeah. breaks, though. At, at right. Huawei, we ha we had a five minute break. People can chat. They can reconnect with friends if they decide they want to go to the hallway track or follow up with the speaker. They can do that without breaking the flow. And you know, seems so to work very well. What you see here, this is uh, this is the the, the schedule. Uh, basically, our internal. Um, a spreadsheet that we use for organizing the schedule um, doesn't have the specific talks just the talk slots in here uh, but <laughs> an impression of how many talks we actually had and you see the poster slots here and then we had some additional sponsor rooms I wanted to uh, mention the sponsor rooms as well but uh, let me first do this one um, this is the setup that we had and then we had for each of those uh, sessions we had uh, staff allocation so we always had two people in each of those sessions. Uh, one person called a session chair. The session chair's role was to actually speak to the audience and speak to the, uh, talk to the speaker, introduce the speaker and so on, basically moderate the session. And then the room manager was responsible for the, the technical side of things. So the room manager made sure that the, you know, the audio was properly set up, the speaker was onboarded before the talk session was then guided into the webinar so that everything was you know, kind of smooth. And also in case of any problems uh, with the internet connection or so, the, the room manager would then uh, jump in and then try to help. So we had two people per, per room and that turned out to be a very good setup. Uh, now in terms of the, your, your question, Francesco, with the uh, fatigue, uh, Actually, we, we, the, the original thought was that maybe we can do, you know, maybe three hours in a row per person. But actually, it turned out that it's not that tiring after all, because uh, you always get to do new things. You have to uh, work with, you know, different kinds of, of people. You have to uh, solve different problems. You have to hop around a lot. So there's a lot to do. Um, it's not just about, you know, watching the talk that's going on. So it doesn't really happen that much. And uh, as you can see here, the people 
who are working, uh, you know, some people like Martin, for example, he basically was there all day. Um, I, I was there all day as well, I think, at least on the second one. Um, and, and this was manageable. And uh, you can also see here that we started early and then we, um, we ended very late. So the reason why we did that is because we wanted to have both the Asian time zones, uh, you know, get some content as well as the European ones, of course, which is our main audience. And then of course, all the Americas as well. So what we found with the Europython online is that we, we were getting a lot more people from the Americas to the conference than we had before. So that was an interesting aspect. And that's also something that going forward, we will probably do something hybrid, meaning that we will, you know, once we can have an in-person conference again, we will probably still maintain this kind of online audience and give out online tickets so that people who cannot easily travel or for whom the, the travel is just, you know, asking too much, like let's say coming from Japan, for example, uh, they can just join online. So that's uh, your, I, your, I, your questions was about, um, was it audience fatigue or staff fatigue? Because I think audience fatigue is the bigger thing. You know, if it, the audience switches off or like, if there's I, two bad talks in a row, you can lose a lot of audience. So what we, um, the, the, I think the question was actually about the organizers uh, fatigue, whether they uh, were, you know, w whether it was too much for them. And the, the answer there basically is that it actually did work out quite well. Coming to the audience, we, what we found is interesting. Um, so one detail that we found was that people tend to only join the conference during the business hours, their business hours, right? Which uh, we find, you know, we, we found a bit odd. I mean, but we actually saw that, that, you know, when, when business closed in Europe, we had fewer attendees. And then the, of course, in, in the Americas, people joined and then, you know, filled in those, uh, those slots. And it was the same in, in, in Asia. So th that was an interesting experience. And, and we think that this has to do with the fact that people probably, uh, you know, they are told by the, by their companies to join these events. And then after the, you know, the day is over, they just go home. <laughs> so it was interesting. We wouldn't have expected that, but uh, that's what we found. Uh, in, in terms of fatigue, what we also found is that a lot of people only joined a few of the sessions. So we did not have that many people who actually stayed for the whole day. It's actually the same as the, the, the personal conference as well. If you found like you're tired, you can go to the quiet room, you can go to, you know, the coffee stand, you can go out from the venue. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I was going to suggest you have, you have the power with the scheduling keynotes. Um, so especially like we're on the West coast of the U S you don't need to schedule all your keynotes first thing. You can spread them through the day. Uh, you can have one later in the afternoon just to keep, keep the audience sticking around, you know, if there's going to be a power speaker. So you can control the audience like that. And I was going to we say- have a, We have a keynote in the afternoon, right? Sure. And also when we have pajamas. So pajamas in December is going to be 24 hours. So you get real time analytics of who's having a vodka party and watching this at three in the morning and who's watching it from the office. And perhaps it depends, like you said, if your employer is paying and compelling you to attend this conference versus you really, really want to do it. And maybe that comes back to the tracks thing. So if you sort of keep the data science track more, you know, cohesive, stuff like that. Just a thought. Actually, yeah. in my case, I was able to attend only two talks at EuroPython this year, and they were all after business hour. And uh, one was Jessica, another talk, which was great, actually. Um, but yes, I can totally, I can totally see that because you know, lots of people join because of work, right? The company pays. The company says, okay, you know, you should really go to a conference, come on, and uh, uh, and you know. To do the business hour thing so that's uh, uh, I yeah. also think that a lot of people was just at home right and then after office hours your probably your family's back right <laughs> yeah I think people would consider this as like work thing so they yeah it's it, it's versus when you travel to a conference you could basically you go there for this right so you can devote a lot of time in it you can stick around for beer afterwards or whatever but when you are in your home then of course you still want to separate this from your family life and all this stuff because this is considered as work. So, um, yeah. 
that, that's for normal people, right? We were partying at the 11 at night. Yeah, yeah I'm not talking about like <laughs> us that, yeah, now doing it this like in the evening. But <laughs> I, I think one really nice feature for the online conference is that I agree with you, right? So in a conference in real life, yeah, maybe you are tired, you go to a quiet room or you go outside to, to have a walk. But the nice about the online conference is that if you miss it a talk, then if in YouTube, they say it's a YouTube feature, uh, you can go back in the streaming and watch that talk uh, at, the, at the, the same day in the conference. So I think that was, that was super nice. Yeah, while well, you're mentioning YouTube, um, another point that we would do different than what we did this year is uh, we would not make the YouTube stream uh, closed to just the, the paying audience. So we would actually open that up, make it available to everyone. Because what, what we found is that people are more than willing to, to actually pay extra if for, for getting the interactivity and getting access to the chat and getting access to you know, uh, people directly, let's say for the posters, uh, or also for the, for the speakers. Um, and, and then by opening up everything on YouTube and live streaming to YouTube, which we did anyway, as an extra service to the attendees so that they, for example, could watch the conference on their TVs or so. Um, we, we would have probably gotten even you know, more attention worldwide. And uh, if, if you're running a conference that happens every single year, it's, this is actually good advertising for your conference. If you go online now and then you go you know, in person again in, in let's say a year or two, probably in two years, but um, then you will most likely have people join that conference, the in-person conference, because they saw your conference and how it worked online uh, on YouTube. Uh, or, you know, maybe they paid and then they also have the interaction there. So, but, but they definitely get a feeling for how the conference works. And that's, I think that's a good, um, it's a good investment. You don't lose a lot. When originally we thought that we, we, we were a bit, um, let's say, uh, we were not sure how many people we would actually have paying for the conference and whether we could actually, uh, you know, get enough income back to cover the cost. Um, so that's why we initially we made it a, a closed uh, session. Normally for the in-person event, we always have uh, live streaming uh, free to, to YouTube and anyone can just join there. Uh, in, in the past years, when we did the live streaming for the in-person event, we found that not a lot of people actually join these streams. So we were actually considering maybe turning that off simply because it's too too costly for us to do. But um, now with the online event, it's different. So we, we found that a lot of people actually like to use YouTube to watch the um, the conference. So it's definitely something to consider. One, one thing I did do is yeah. you're actually able to invite your friends in real time to sign up. So the whole, the old school proposition that you sign up for a conference weeks before and decide if you're going to pay or not pay goes out the window. So if there's a really good session, like I can message my friends and say, hey, so-and-so is talking about such and such, you should join. And it's basically, yeah, a donation suggested. Um, but I don't know how, uh, you probably don't like Twitter much, but it, it, any media, any media attention, LinkedIn, Twitter, anything in real time, you can try to, you know, attract people. I don't know if you like that idea. Yes, uh, I mean, we, we, with uh, Twitter in particular, we, we always have the problem that uh, it's hard to find people who actually want to, you know, manage the Twitter account during the conference. Because, of course, as you, as you can see here, that we have lots of people, uh, you know, involved in actually running the conference. So there's no one left to run the Twitter account anymore. Well, but, we've got uh, one guy in America who runs a Twitter account. Oh, okay, excellent. So we probably need one of those as well. You just <laughs> need a thousand people to filter him. Do yes. you mind sharing that person with us? <laughs> oh, oh, we're, we're going to send them to you one way. Please don't ever try to return them. <laughs> okay. So any, any other questions? Uh, something, uh, before we continue, something I wanted to mention because we just kind of, you know, uh, glossed over that a bit. Uh, something that's important when you're running the conference is to keep in mind that you, you will have sponsors, right? And, and, um, the sponsor booth kind of idea that you have for an in-person conference, uh, we found it doesn't really work well for the online event. So what you can do for the in-person event, for example, is you can, you can put the sponsor booths next to the coffee stations and the food stations, right? And then have people, you know, walk around like that and then, you know, accidentally bump into a booth. 
ask some question there, this doesn't work for the, for the online event. So uh, I, I would suggest that you, you also consider coming up with a way to more integrate the sponsors into the conference schedule. This is something that we didn't do too well. Um, and, and, you know, sponsors, even though they liked the conference and they also had some traffic, um, they didn't really get that much traffic to their uh, rooms that we set up for them. Uh, so what we would change next year is uh, if, if we do it online again, then we would uh, then have the have sponsors give talks and put that directly into the schedule so that people, you know, watch these talks. Even though it's a sponsor talk, doesn't matter. We can you, you can always you know introduce them as a sponsor, and and people will appreciate that. That's that's perfectly fine. Um, but it's it's a better way to get more traffic to the sponsors. Um, question about then late invites and sort of social media. So do you guys think it's tacky if you have say fifty dollar fee, fifty euro, whatever? You get like a ten euro refer a friend discount if your friend signs up. Do you think that works well? Or, I mean, equivalently, we had like tick two for one tickets or three for two tickets with discounts. But with regard to doing it real time, do you think that would actually work? Like, are there any real time analytics on people who joined late? Why did they join? Because somebody uh, recommended, because they found it on the internet late, or because their friend told them to? No, we, we don't. Uh, we, we don't have recommendations. So, this kind of like a discount when you get someone in um, based uh -huh. on your recommendation. Uh, we also don't have a lot of statistics on, on you know, the whole payment process. We, what we found is that we did have quite a few signups rather late in the process. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's interesting is that we did not have that many people join late. So, mm -hmm. of course, when, for the in-person conference, you know, the, the dynamics of ticket sales are completely different than for the online event because it's, you know, you have to plan in advance, you have to buy the tickets in advance, you can get better prices if you buy early and so on. We have early bird tickets, for example. Um, for, the, for the online event, it's different because people can sign up very late. Uh, you know, people tend to not buy the tickets early on, or at least that's what- You, you give an early bird discount, right? And then you say, hey, the deadline's going away and that doesn't work these days? For the, for the um, online event, we did not have an early bird, but for the in-person one, we de yeah. definitely do. And, and usually we have them sold out in like, say, five minutes or so. So it's like we sell five to 300, yeah. uh, two to uh, 300 tickets uh, in five minutes. Right. So sure. um, this is something that definitely works for an in-person conference. For the online yes. one, I'm, I don't know whether it would work. Uh, oh, it has, it has. I mean, I, that's something I've yeah? been doing for ah, 16 okay. years already. And if, even if you have some sort of raffle and just say, hey, sign up for your early bird and we're gonna have a raffle for a free t-shirt, things like that actually work. Or And you can throw in your sponsors mm -hmm. thing, like whatever, IBM's, one month free of IBM's, data science, mm -hmm. whatever. And you, you, know, you can kill many birds with one stone and drive the early uh, turnout. Right. What, what I like is that I heard earlier that you say the referral program thingy. I, I kind of like that, you know, like encourage people to introduce your Python to their friends rather than just, you know, we keep the same audience every year, so. Yeah, actually, actually yeah, here's the thing we used to do at SFPython uh, at PyBay, like have a newbie track, specifically bring a friend, bring a friend who doesn't, you know, bring your PHP friend and convert them in 60 minutes, not quite, but that's the, have a new a track that's guaranteed to be newbie friendly and like there's no, people won't harass you for asking stupid quote unquote stupid questions and stuff. That's actually a good practice. Also, the other thing is that um, I guess you have a lot of companies uh, they are registering like five people, right? You have the admin registering, you know, five, six people at least. In our case, it works like that, you know. And uh, um, if you could give them a discount for registering a bunch of people, they might register you know, a couple more, right? Because, hey, they're free or kind of free. So, Wait. We sort of do have that. Um, uh, we have like a that's that's going through like a t um, sponsorship route, which Mark might be able to show. But basically, if you buy like five tickets, I think it's if you buy five tickets or ten tickets, you get extra tickets for free. Yeah, yeah, that's basically kind of for uh, you know kind of discount, you know, some kind of thing. 
I love the logo, by the way. It's beautiful. So, anyone has more questions? I do. Rebecca, Leo, yeah. I do. Uh, I didn't, um, I wasn't there for the sprints, uh, so I just want to curious, uh, how did the sprints go? Especially when you have all the leads leading each of their, each of their own sprints. Um, they had the option of using Discord and stuff like that. I was just wondering in general, how did the sprints go? Normally, like, uh, I think, um, uh, in person it's quite, quite different, but on virtually, I was wondering, uh, how did it get on uh, this year? I would say in my opinion, it went very well. I was leading one of the projects as well. I think people are very engaging and um, yeah, I, I think that it works. Like the format using Discord for Sprints definitely work. Uh, we have done that before as well. So yeah, I think that, that works. Yeah, I, I think especially for, for Sprints, Discord is a, really the ideal platform. So because you typically have smaller teams, maybe you know, up to 20 people in one team. So that's, that fits perfectly into the uh, kind of the audio visual setup that uh, Discord provides. And of course you have everything in, in one place. So what you see here, this is the, uh, the sprint section of uh, Discord that we had. And we had um, a text channel here, a general one, the, basically the hallway for the sprints. And then for each of these um, sprints, we had a, a separate uh, text section here plus an audio section down here. And the audio also allows you to do video or screen sharing. So that was used a lot. And uh, people did not actually, you know, divert into other tools to run the sprints. That's great to hear. At least you don't have any, uh, everyone trying to download everything at once in the morning problem yeah. anymore. <laughs> That's true, right? But I also enjoyed the sprints a lot. They were super nice. Everything was on Discord. And that was, I really like the one feature that is in Discord, you have like, when you are presenting, when you are sharing your, sc your screen or something, there is like a, a small, uh, a small closed caption or something. So you can, and, and it was trivial for me to be jumping between the sprints, right? To see what was happening there, to have like a preview. That is, it was like the equivalent to be in a sprint and to be walking around all the tables, right? Uh, also, the audio was so the the sprint I was we were using the audio, and that was super nice because we were like a full, full day there. So it was, I think for that in particular, Discord was really good because it's all a small a small groups so of four or five, maybe I don't know. I think the team I was we were like ten at the some point, but then the audio was working really good. That that was I I really liked the the sprints. I, I think it's also like it's really convenient to run the sprints for a long time because you have people from different time zones and that fits the online format really well. What I do think that we might have not done a great job at is perhaps like it, we, we didn't prepare extremely well so we didn't know who was necessarily going to show up or not. So even though most of the teams were absolutely amazing, there were a couple that we just never heard from. So I think in hindsight, uh, probably we would have contacted each team lead in advance and then maybe know when and how they're going to show up or present their sprints. And um, so I think that's just yeah. a minor thing. I think, yeah, next year I'm very keen to, to do this because uh, I'm also doing this like constantly with uh, Tanya as well for help different conference to organize sprints and other stuff. So, yeah. Thanks. That's cool. It's, uh, great to see that format works really well online. A um, quick comment to Raquel and other guys. Uh, so like the tried, it, tried and tested way of rewarding people for showing up at sprints is, you know, give them a remainder of the t-shirts or whatever conference swag uh, and just have a whole of Hall of Fame of people who completed their sprints, so any little gamified social engineering techniques that cost almost nothing. And have them take pictures of themselves at their sprint or whatever. Or whatever. I, I yeah, don't know maybe what, we what, could... how it is for, for you at, at, at Pi Bay, but uh, what, what we always have for the in-person event where you can then actually you know, see people uh, working at the sprints is that we always have two day sprints. We have Saturday and Sunday for sprints. And then Saturday we have, you know, maybe 
let's say one third or one fourth of the uh, conference audience is still there for the sprints. And then on Sunday, everyone starts to leave. And so it's about, you know, maybe half the count that we have on Saturdays. Is that similar to what you see? But I'm sorry, you're talking about the old sort of in-person? Yeah, for the in-person one. Um, I didn't attend it myself, but I mean, I'm guessing you're about right. It's, it's, you know, especially because the sprints are typically on the Monday and Tuesday after. I'm uh, thinking uh, what mm -hmm. we could do with the virtual one is that we could give the people who attend the sprint a certificate. Yeah, basically, like, it's easier if it's online, we can just email them a certificate with the name on it so they can share on social media, whatever, you know, um, rather than swag because we have to post them, which is a bit too much to I think. Do. No, no, but for the swag, yeah, I mean, if they're all in the same area or something, I guess you just, you know, stick them all in a box and surface melee. But, uh, yeah, just for for this year, obviously, I think they I think they killed all the sprints for Pi Bay because uh, it was already at five nervous breakdowns just organizing the conference. So, yeah. so it, but because you're mentioning swag, so for the, yeah. I just wanted to, to highlight that. So what we did is for... Um, well, of course, we had digital swag, right? So uh, we we asked the sponsors to to you know uh, make things available like coupon codes, PDF files with uh, you know more information about their product or whatever they wanted to give us. Um, and so we made that available, put it all on the web page, and so for, for the for people to then download from there. Or of course, they could go to uh, the um, their. Uh, the, the sponsor Zoom rooms and then pick up things from there or the, the chat channels that we had for them. Um, something that uh, in terms of, you know, physical swag, because of course we couldn't do that, we didn't want to do, uh, you know, postal mail or so. What we did is we set up a, um, a merch shop specifically for the conference and we set that up before the conference so that people could actually yep. buy swag before the conference and then for example wear the conference t-shirt at the conference and then you know, show off a bit so um, that was you know i wouldn't say it was a, a huge success but it was definitely something that people appreciated us doing so that uh, you know they liked this kind of being able to to have something that's um, physical yeah, I really like that. I, I don't know whether we should actually like do throughout the year. We have maybe a week or a month like to, okay, you can reorder the the, the kind of like the design from maybe like, let's say, uh, Euro Python in Edinburgh edition. So we can like have that logo only available for a week or so. So if you want to get that, you better get it now. Things and like that. Yeah. and, and you, you can key it to early bird signups. So you can have the super, super selective. Um, yeah, for us, we're different. We're in the San Francisco Bay Area. So you know, you could just have like one person has all the swag for San Jose, one has it for Oakland, one has it for whatever, Marin County. Uh, also, the, there are some drop ship t-shirt printers and you just upload the design and they'll do it. Um, I don't know how you manage quality control, but they do exist and you can probably manage bulk ships with those people too. But we had a, um, a service for that called a Spreadshirt and I think that exists in the US as well. So. This is what we use. They ship worldwide. Uh, unfortunately, they don't ship to the US because if you sign up with the European shop that they have, they don't ship to the US. You have to sign up with the US one if you want the cover, want to cover the US as well. And I guess that's for tax reasons. Um, and also for tax reasons, we decided not to set up the one in the US because, you know, all this um, withholding tax stuff and all the regulations and documents and forms and stuff that was just simply too much for us to handle. Um, but it's, you know, it's definitely something that, uh, that makes people, you know, feel nice about the conference and, it, you know, it's, it's a way to, to make them feel more um, being part of the conference. No, no, totally. I, I think, it, like you said, if people wear it in the session, it gives a f and then you see it in the videos, and if the video goes to YouTube or something offsite, it really, it's killer. Um, I could try to connect you guys offline to... There must be like a billion people over here I know who know about conference swag and you know if you need to set up a reciprocal arrangement like with um, with PyCon so like you know they handle US swag you handle their European swag maybe is this doable yeah we could try to so, set up something yes so but PyCon is not is, isn't Pi Bay it's all it's different again they were in Cleveland right. uh, Stephen I remember now that we were presenting and you asked about the Euro Python 2021 uh, uh, yes, a, yes, yes. 
there, there, there is a high probability that it's going to be online. We don't know yet. We, it's, uh, it's something that we're discussing. But seeing what's happening and seeing the situation and seeing the situation yeah. in Dublin, there is a high probability that it's yeah. going to be online. We were also thinking on a hybrid event, but probably. I'm going I'm to I'm going to go to Dublin anyway. I'll have a pint with some Python people if my government allows me to. If it kills me, yeah. So. <laughs> but I bet you a bottle of the finest sherry that it is online, though. <laughs> we, Would you like to take that bet? So to be honest, it's not online. We are th thinking on distributed. So yeah. you can you can. You can be there with a small group of friends, the number that is allowed yes. by the government. Yeah, actually that sort of bubble watch party thing is probably yeah. where we're going, we're going to be next year. That's and what, it's what, we're, what we're discussing at the moment, right? Yeah, and you know, if it's, if it's a company, they can all go to the boardroom and order a pizza or whatever. Yeah, we, we, but we better like be co-organizing this like for local groups if they want to set things up we will give them support so we have encouraging them to have their own mini events uh, at the local venue is that liquid encouraging <laughs> tax issues okay yeah we're gonna try to investigate that that kind of setup a bit and um, we try to encourage people to do exactly that already for this year but i don't know whether anyone really did uh, run that kind of setup it, it's definitely something that you know makes it makes the whole conference experience a bit more you know real so that I mean, if you yeah. sit together with a few colleagues let's say five or ten yeah. people uh, and then watch the the streams and then can have discussions and so on and i think that's uh, makes a better experience than you know sitting in yeah. your but un unfortunately for like at least for most of the us i mean companies like the security employees are programmed to you know basically detain employees if they find them coming into the office right at least in california okay. and if all of my meetup friends are scared of liability well, nobody will do it now but we can encourage like university group to do that as well you know like usually where people organize meetups so maybe like for for europe people tends to go to people's office but maybe in us people go to universities right. you know like or something like we work you know they you can hire a venue or things like that so yeah i think really up to the local organizers uh, to arrange but what, what i'm saying if the, if the county of santa clara says it's illegal then it's not going to happen no but the I, county. I don't think that we have any intention to do that if the coronavirus situation is yeah. still going up like this obviously we're thinking of when you know next summer when things are much much better when like the government is allowing everybody to which, gather like which, in which smaller government? groups the government is what is it but yeah so we, we, we don't have the intention to just like do that against the the trend of this yeah, we won't know till for another six to nine months anyway yeah. with the vaccines and all that kind of stuff. But currently, Dublin is at the moment on the on the brink of maybe going to level four, you know. What? <laughs> you know, it's we're at level, you know. It's, it's just... <laughs> but the good thing about this plan is that we can always go yeah. further or back, right? But the, 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 the option <laughs> is, the option is if things get a little bit better, especially in Ireland, there's a lot of co-sharing space, especially in the rural, more kind of outside of Dublin, in the smaller towns and cities. They have all their kind of co-sharing remote working offices so a lot of people are all, all about i don't want to work from home but there is a co-sharing space you know uh building in town so right. they will go there you know and they will meet other people and so this is before COVID comes in so i'm assuming i'm hoping that if things get a little bit better that the local communities themselves or those co-sharing spaces like porter shed in galway i think there's a there's one down in Kerry as well there's one in sligo there's in waterford and all that so there's lots lots of these pop a lot of these kind of co-sharing spaces uh, that are pocketed around the communities around Ireland, and if if they yeah. wanted to start if start if they wanted to get people back in once it opens up a little bit more and things get a little yeah. bit better, this might be you know one type of event that you know I say they'd be really happy to host because it's a kind of a uh, an Irish slash you know it's it's a it's kind of a a, a, a Europe, big European conference and you know it, and it's meant to be in Dublin and Ireland, and um, I say there be I, I said, um, I, I, no, it'd be an opportunity anyway to connect different communities that way instead of everyone traveling to Dublin, which we would love if, you know, everything was all, you know, nice and stuff. But it's really yeah, the point, the point, Tepo. It's not still, like, not that favorable next year. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea, Vicky. So I'm just thinking, I know tons and tons of uh, 
co-locations, incubators, and they're all dying to death. And we could probably get in the Bay Area, we could probably get the place for free if we said, we're going to bring <laughs> you a ton of people. No, and the, and the way you would do it is you say, everybody has to go get a COVID test 10 days before and show their certificate. And you have a tracing list and the stat, you have a sign-in sheet, you have a tracing list, all that stuff. But you could probably get the facility for free and they'd be happy and we'd be happy. Uh, so that's, I think that's a good idea. So more questions? Going back to the ask me everything. All right, can I mention that for the follow up on the best practices for online conferences in 2021, maybe you want to carve out a session at uh, Pajamas and we can get the European and the uh, American and the Asian folks all talking about. And, and the Oceania, sorry. When, when is that event? Oh, oh, you guys know? It's, uh, it's the, on the 5th of uh, December. So it's, it's kind of like we have another separate organizing team. So it's not a EuroPython thing, but uh, yeah. But we may, we may work together with Python Island to do that, actually. Uh, now we are in the kind of discussion about that. So, uh, so it would kind of be like a, a, an event kind of uh, by Python Island, but also organized by a team of uh, volunteers. Maybe we can have some kind of panel discussion or so at the at, at the event, and then you know, maybe you can put. Could you put the the details into the chat so I'm, that? Um, I'm just I'm just dropping a link. Yeah. Also, so Pi Pi Gotham in New York City. Um, does it help if I I could email? Um, was it Nicholas who sent the email? If I could send a roll up of all online Python yes. conferences I'm aware of, and we could syndicate them all, and would that work? you could just uh, reply the help desk tickets, and then we'll all see it. Yeah, I oh, am, okay. yeah, I'm also organizing pajamas, but I, I asked my organizing team to try to come today, but I think I'm the only one. <laughs> Are they clothed? The pajamas people? Yeah, the... Sorry, that, yeah, was we have, that was a pun. Sorry? Yeah, that was a pun. Don't reply to the pun. I, I think Rebecca <laughs> has a question. I do, I do. I was just wondering about um, the Zoom license sharing and um, that side of things. I haven't read anything properly about it yet, but we are about to buy um, Zoom licenses um, to get ourselves sorted. So I just wanted to find out what that was about from your side. Rachel, do you want to talk to that? Uh, <laughs> well, we basically just want to because we have bought these Zoom licenses when we were preparing for the conference and we currently still kept, we're keeping several licenses just, you know, to run these sessions, etc. So we thought, well, we might as well just share with the community in case like people want to host an event. So we have like, uh, we have shared with um, like several meetups, including the Munich one and the Argentina and I think some others. So basically, if you are thinking of hosting an event and we could just share these licenses with you, which is uh, quite simple uh, on Zoom, um, but it of course depends on your size and scale. So mm. we, if you're thinking of like a thousand, a thousand kind of attendee with six tracks, then we, we, we currently don't yet have that. We're not paying for that just now. So yeah. we would then have to like think about whether we could support that. But right. if it's like smaller events, uh, yeah, we're happy to do that. So but I of think course, like, we... also like just to want to mention, if you want to host a really big event and our Zoom license that currently don't have that facility, you could also apply for a grant. Just right. Uh... <laughs> Very good. Um, because I think uh, we're, we're just running two tracks um, and currently have 250 attendees um, and we've got a couple of weeks to the event. Um, so maybe that's something to look into then. Because um, yeah, we went through, um, yeah, we did the webinar. We'd, I think there was discussion between the pro or business license and things like that. So um, who, do, who do I talk to? Uh, visit you Rachel properly about that maybe offline uh, I think we I think you could just um send I think you already sent us an email before yes sure, so if you yes. could just yes uh, so if you just you know just uh, talk to us on the help sure. desk uh, because like we all can see it uh, okay. we're not, yeah 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 perfect yeah.
Actually, to save you money, Rebecca, I'm just thinking that the suggestion we just had, if people are watching in bubbles, even if it's two or three people, the pricing for Zoom is per, basically per node. It's not really, you know, so if you have one node is five people, you're still mm -hmm. paying the same flat fee. Now, all the prices jump big time at sort of 250, 500 attendees. Right. So if, yes. we, if okay. we get... It depends a bit on, on what you want to, um you know the kind of setup that you want to have so for for mm -hmm. like two to three hundred people uh, i would already recommend using a webinar license mm -hmm. uh, it also saves you a bit of trouble you know uh, in terms of moderation uh, you know people doing nasty stuff on the sessions and so on uh, because the webinar license uh, is, is more restricted to a set of panelists and you usually just just have a few panelists the panelists are typically your speakers uh, and, and then uh, the attendees, uh, you can only see their names, so you can turn off chat if you like. Uh, so you don't have that much to, to run in terms of moderation. This is what we did for the, for the larger uh, rooms that we had. And then if you have smaller sessions, let's say up to maybe 50 even or 60 people, you can use a Zoom, a, a Zoom meeting, like what we are doing now here, where you can actually then see everyone. That creates a you know a better atmosphere if you want to do more interactive stuff. Yes. Uh, if you just if you just want to do talks, then the webinar is better. Now, what we currently have is one webinar license, um, which can at the moment it can take up to one hundred people, but we can easily bump that up to five hundred. Uh, and then we have a number of uh, Zoom uh, Pro licenses, which are on a business account, so you get up to three hundred people for each of those licenses. Right. That, that all actually sounds like exactly what we were going to buy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll have, a, I'll have a, a think and a chat with um, the board here and um, get in touch with you guys as well. So that's great. Thank you very much for your comments there, everybody. But, so do you guys have like a worldwide pricing discount with Zoom? I mean, if not, it's time to hit them up and just say, we're not <laughs> give us, no, seriously, give us a Python worldwide pricing for all our peeps. <laughs> we, we basically this is uh, we've organized by ourselves. So uh, we, we just got the business account uh, for the for the European conference, yeah. and and that was you know good enough for us. And you know the, the costs are not really that high anyway, mm. uh, it, because for for the when you do a conference, you typically just get all these licenses for a month, and um, yeah. We also found that with uh, with uh, Zoom licenses, you can often get uh, a, a pro rata kind of. Um, uh, you only pay pro rata for the for like uh -huh. half or so, so you can even reduce the, the pricing the, the prices even more. So it's it's not really you know it doesn't make a lot of sense to negotiate big discounts or anything. But that said, um, Zoom is very competitive, so. If you, uh, we, we were contacted, for example, by a key key account manager, and because when we, you know, we took down the licenses again, they of course they ask why you're taking them down again. We're just making nice money on you, so yeah. why are you walking away? And uh, so there's definitely some room there for negotiations. If, for example, this would be set up in a larger scale kind of thing. Well, j just in terms of like retaining people and subscribers, so. The same hosting service now. So in San Francisco Python, they switched they switched over to um, hosting the monthly meetings. Also on Remo, they got some special pricing. Mm -hmm. So if you, it's it's kind of an annoying. You set up the whole conference infrastructure, attract all the people, and then you switch back to whatever it is, YouTube or something else for your monthly user group meetings. How how do you guys do that? Have you managed to sort of port your audience? Well, we, we just have the annual event right now, right? So uh, what we are doing is we're just check, we're keeping the licenses because we want to, first of all, we want to make it possible to share the licenses with the community, but also we're using them ourselves and uh, for, for our meetings, for example. And the, the cost for these Loom Pro licenses are not really high. So it's yeah. just... Something that no, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying in terms of stickiness, like, you know, acquiring members, you know, subscribers is hard. So it j nobody... Everybody is using something different for their local user group meetings in their right. own cities or countries. Are they? Is anybody managed to join the two together? I, I think I think so. I think everyone is setting up. Um, so, so far, I haven't seen any other um, you know 
options to basically share or get a shared license from someone else. I think we're pretty much the only one doing this at this point. It would certainly be possible because, you know, if you have the licenses lying around, why not just give them to someone else for a certain amount of time? Well, I was going to suggest, I think, the middle ground. So, PyVideo.org, are you the guys also who can do that? Uh, PyVideo.org uh, has... Yeah, has this is not a, I don't know who's doing it right now. I, I... Yeah. They've got SciPy, PyCon US, Peninsula, Minsk, Python, Pajamas, 2019, and a bunch of things. It's a pretty good aggregator. So, it's like the YouTube of Python conference video. Um, it's pretty good. I, I think we're, we're on that as well. At least they, they, they tend to put up the EuroPython videos uh, on, on that side too, after a while. Mm. But I, I'm not sure who's managing it right now. I, I know that the, the one person or two people that um, did it in the past, they kind of stepped down because it was too much work. And, but I think it's been picked up by someone else now. And so it's... I mean, I think it's... The, there, there is always the someone uh, adding the EuroPython videos there because I, I saw the EuroPython videos on that website and I sent a, a video there and it's just a pull request in a GitHub repo. So mm -hmm. you have to create a pull request for them and, and that sort. Right. But there is probably someone doing that for EuroPython. Maybe, maybe they are doing that. <laughs> um, I, I just have a quick question in between because I see that people are leaving already. Um, we, we are recording this session. Uh, I was just wondering whether you're all fine with putting the recording up on YouTube afterwards. So if you have anything against that, then please let us know, then we won't. Otherwise, we would just put it up on YouTube so that other people can, you know, get some feedback as well that way. It's fine. Okay, perfect. So time for the last questions. Oh, I did have one quick one. Um, was, did you have to do much post-production work on videos and that side of things? Yes. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it wasn't us doing it. It was our, we have a video recording company that we're working with uh, every single year. And they also, typically they also do the recording for us at the in-person event. Right. And then afterwards they do the editing and then, uh, and then uh, upload everything to YouTube for us. Um, what we did this year is we, of course, we did not have the uh, them record everything because basically Zoom did that for us already. Uh, but we gave them all the recordings and they did the editing. So and and they appreciated that very much because they don't have a lot of business at the moment. So um, that's what they did, and they are currently preparing everything. We are uploading the videos in, in batches right now. Right. Uh, we currently have 90 videos online, and in the end, we're going to have something like 130 or so. Wow. Okay, no, that's right. helpful. We um, have thought, oh, we actually need to do something about that this week, so starting to get a couple of quotes in. So um, I can put you in touch with the uh, with the company. I mean, yeah. because everything is remote, I mean, it would probably also work for you. So. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, if you could, I would appreciate that very much. Thank you. I think it's a good idea because this company has been doing their Python videos for a long time, so they have a lot mm -hmm. of experience. That sounds great. Thank you. But yes, there is a lot of pre-work and post-work, I would say. Yes. <laughs> I think I th maybe we <laughs> I'm thinking there might be a lot more work in the next few weeks for me, so <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Uh, something, uh, just a recommendation where if you use uh, the Zoom cloud for the recording, uh, we've had some reports before the conference that Zoom is, Zoom cloud is not the most reliable thing on earth. So okay. some, um, we had, uh, I think it was Moshe who was mentioning that. Uh, he's from Israel and they, they were using the, uh, they were using Zoom recording for recording their university courses and they actually lost quite a, quite a few of these recordings. Um, so what we did is we basically had everything recorded on YouTube, but then um, during the night after the, after the event, well, we had multiple days. So um, after the uh, conference days, we always downloaded everything from, from Zoom Cloud and then onto, you know, FTP servers, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, just to have a backup there. So right. that's something that I would recommend as well. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, if you have YouTube streaming, then YouTube will automatically convert everything to YouTube videos as well. Uh, 
there's just one catch there. Um, they will not convert live streams that are longer than eight hours. Right. Okay. So uh, as soon as your your stream is longer than eight hours, they will not automatically convert that to an archive anymore. And that's something that we basically found out the hard way. So <laughs> we lost the YouTube streams. It wasn't bad because we had the Zoom streams anyway. So we just mm -hmm. uh, we uploaded those. So. Sure. Um, okay. You can just uh, also just record locally onto your machine on Zoom as well. So you don't have to rely on uh, Zoom uh, cloud recordings. Um, so obviously uh, that, that person will have to have a huge hard disk to make to, to capture all the videos. But um, that's how I've been doing some of the stuff as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, recording if I'm using Zoom. Um, but, but I guess like, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to make, make one comment there. Uh, to give you a better idea of how much you, space you have to, uh, you know, make available for the recordings, um, a typical recording of, let's say, one, one hour, one hour and a half is about like six gigabytes in terms of recording on Zoom. Okay. Because Zoom is doing more than one video, right? It's one video for, you have the view of the speaker, the right. attendees view, the audio. The... I can yeah. I can perhaps show you what that looks like. Um, let me just go there. Yeah, I, so like if you're using the cloud recording, then you would be recording set different views that Mark would probably show you. So you would have the speaker view on the gallery view. Um, but if you're recording locally, I think you only get I'm not sure whether, I don't think you get both views, so you are a little bit limited, I do believe. Um, and also, it, so it sort of depends on the view, it, how, how much, so the size also depends on the view. If you have a lot of people, if you're doing this gallery view with a lot of people, obviously the size will be bigger than just two people. I think also something important to mention is, if you, if you take a look now to the list of participants, you can see that the recording icon is in all the cohorts. So I have it, Raquel, Mark, Chuck, Martin. And, and, and that, that's quite handy because we were changing uh, the host, right? During the conference. So but we, you turn on the, the recording at the morning and then you forget about it. And at least you only need to have at least one co-host or one host in the Zoom uh, meeting or webinar for the for the meeting to be recorded and, and that's that's really good because if someone disconnects for any reason and it, then it's not a problem because there is always someone else so mm -hmm. that's that, that's a nice feature because otherwise you would depend on the internet of the person that is recording but but lastly like if you also want a local uh, recording as backup then the the co-host or the host or the co-host cannot make a, lo a local recording. So you would have to have a designated person to do your local recording backup, which is a bit odd. I, I, I think <laughs> we could do a whole session on that, uh, uh, you know, because, <laughs> because the, the setup, this recording setup with Zoom is a bit complicated. Um, I just want to show you, uh, this is a typical recording. As you can see here, it's about uh, one hour, 47 minutes. And then you get different views recorded. So you get a speaker view, which uh, only shows the current speaker. You have a gallery view, uh, which shows all the speakers that you have. Uh, this is a shared screen. So this is when, when you do a presentation. Zoom always does uh, screen sharing. So it doesn't really matter which, which tool you're using, whether it's you know, like PowerPoint or LibreOffice or whatever. Um, because what it does is it simply takes the screen content and then uh, streams that to the audience. Uh, so this is, these are recordings with the screen content. Uh, these are recordings without the screen content. And then uh, you can also get just the screen and just the audio. And I'm showing this because this is actually quite useful for the editing company because then they can post edit everything and take these different views and put them together again in a different way than what you, but what Zoom automatically does for you, which is often better because um, the, the, you know, the, the, for example, the, the webcam may, might, might cover something on the slide of the speaker, yeah, and the, the editing company can fix that for you. Right. That's great. 
So then what, what we always do is, uh, this is the, um, uh, this is, these are the, the edited videos. So they always put a slide in front and then they have the, uh, you know, the sponsor slide here and then the, the talk uh, starts. Let me just switch that off. Um, and what we typically do is we have this kind of staging slide, as you can see here in the background, and then the editing company takes the webcam view and then puts in the screen share view over here. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't overlap. And then they also, you know, they look at the uh, the content, uh, and then uh, sometimes they, they edit things in a different way. So for example, for the Q&A afterwards, they then switch to a different view. Yeah, yeah that kind of thing. Great. So this is how it looks afterwards. That's really helpful, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think uh, we have some people are already leaving. I think we are ready to close. Mm -hmm. um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this was a kind of experiment for us. So it's a, it's a learning process. I'm really happy, Rebecca that, and Francesco, really, but that, that you're planning to host an event and, and we can help with, with yeah, the experience. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, just, really just, just write to us, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll see it and answer and discuss, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'll do the applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. See you, everyone. Bye. Have a good evening. Yeah, Thank you. Bye.